Uh, but I want to introduce to you J.W. Wilson. Uh, periodically, I get on the internet and I do scans of uh, brain research and what's happening, the latest fields of learning, etc. About five years ago, uh, this website came up called Cracking the Learning Code. As I got into it, I started reading it and said, man, this, this guy makes a lot of sense. And uh, at the bottom of that, uh, JW talked a lot about that after 20 years of research and $4 billion worth of research and traveling the world and talking to over 100 different uh, brain researchers throughout the world, that there's a learning code. We all have a learning code in our DNA. And if we don't understand how to manage systems, to switch on the learning code, it's just not going to happen. You're just not going to have learning taking place. And it made a lot of sense to me, and uh, I called him up and said, dude, you make a lot of sense, and he was amazed by that. <laughs> and uh, ever since then, we just uh, started to form a collegial relationship and uh, writing some works and publishing, et cetera. And then about a year ago, I said, you know, we got to get you to the Deming Conference. And uh, he said, yeah, I went to Deming, you know, back in 1980s and when I was going through management and things like that because uh, JW is uh, an, also an entrepreneur. He's created over 25 different companies over the last 20 some years, 20 or 30 years. But we sat down and we said, you know what, we, you know, we really think about the neuroscience of Deming, you know, because look at all this. We've got all these people sitting here long after Deming has died. What's, what's clicking in our brains that still causes this thinking to click with people? What's happening neurologically? And so we both got very excited about that and <coughs> sat down and started putting it together. And uh, then I called uh, Kevin and said, you know, we got to get this guy on the program. And so here we are. So I would like to introduce to you J.W. Wilson. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see if I can turn this on now. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? OK, there it goes. We, we only had one little thing on there. Let me get my pants on here. All right. Well, thank you guys all very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, David said, well, what, you know, I, I, when he talked to me, I said, you know what? I think there's probably, Deming would not work. The system of profound knowledge would not work unless there was a neurological reason. Something has to be happening in the brain in order for us to, to transform the way we perceive systems and the interconnectedness between systems. And I told David, I said, you know, I could probably put this together pretty quickly. Well, about three months later, <laughs> I thought it was going to take me three days. It's very intricate what's happening, but it's very powerful. And I believe what this is, by looking at Demi through the eyes of what I call the new sciences. At the Advanced Learning Institute, we do research into uh, basically genetic and biological research into the basis of behavioral change and learning. And as David said, we came up with a code. There's basically a code in your DNA, we discovered. You get six feet of DNA in each one of your cells. And inside of that code, basically that's six feet of DNA, that's the reason why it's so hard to to figure out what's going on in DNA. It's, it's so long, but it's jammed up into a cell you can't even see. So the interesting thing is on there, there's segments that when it's turned on, it causes neurological growth, which is learning and behavioral change. So when I started to look at Deming through the eyes of biology, through the lens, Mike today talked about the lens. If we look through at Deming through this lens, everything begins to change. Our perceptions begin to change because we can understand what he was doing and really what has to happen with inside of us to apply his principles. So I'd like to start here. So <clears throat> what we see is basically, I mean, I'm gonna, they just gave me this clicker here, make sure I can work it. So this is, David and I worked through this to figure out how would you, David was really the, the Deming expert and I was the science expert where we came through to figure out how to do this. And as I said, basically this learning code is in your DNA. And each one of us in here, if you're gonna remember anything that you're studying in school today, or tomorrow, or next week, it's gonna to have to turn that code on. Or you know what's gonna to happen to you? You're gonna get an A on the test. And six months from now, you're gonna remember 5%. Let me, who in here is a student? Raise your hand. Okay, who in here last year 
any time in October or November took a test? Raise your hand. Oh, keep your hand up. Everybody keep your hand up. If everybody's got their hand up, who remembers the day, day of the test What was in even 5% of what was on it? Put your hand down if you don't. OK. So from a biological perspective, from a biological perspective, our whole learning system that we're using today is built on a biological fallacy. The idea, think about it, raise your hand back up again. It took a test, all right? Now I want you to get, a, I want you to feel this in your body. How many of you remember squat all of what was on the test? No, how many of you remember squat all, which means don't remember anything? That's right, it's all of you, right? I mean, it's, so from a biological standpoint, what we're doing does not work, yet we're doing it harder. So what did Deming say and what does Peter Senge say? The harder you push an inefficient system, what happens? The greater the inefficiency. You got no child left behind. You got corporations that don't work. I'm working with a, for a couple of corporations right now. You wonder how they make any profit when you really get inside and see what happens. So this code has to be on for transformation to happen. So really what we're going to do is we're going to use neuroscience as a leverage point. And I'm not sure why I'm ricocheting off of this over here. Just tell me where I need to. Sometimes a ricochet and not. If you can turn it down or whatever you can do there. Um, so basically, neuroscience is the leverage point not only to understand them, but understand how we can refine some of the tools that we're using to implement them. So what Einstein said a long time ago, basically, was that as we, as we new, new theories come up, and new science comes up, and new perspectives comes up, it's like walking up a mountain higher. It doesn't disavow anything underneath it. It just gives us new perspective by which we can perceive what we knew, we thought we knew before. And it makes us more elegant in the way we can apply not only the new knowledge, but the old knowledge. And that's really what the science is doing. Oops, sorry. So, when we take the system of profound knowledge, which Mike talked about today, appreciation for the system, understanding variation, theory of, theory of knowledge, and the knowledge of psychology. Basically, when we, we use those together, something happens in the brain that's very unique. What it does is it drives the brain, let me see if I can do this, it drives the brain to go into optimal performance modes, which in turn drives system performance. So the way to optimize the efficiency of any system, if we look at a Taguchi function graph, since we're talking about Demi, basically, if you could put your brain in the optimum state here, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be able to put the system in the optimum state. Now, what we've missed a lot of times, and you'll understand why in a minute, is we've been trying to optimize Demi without having a full, one, a full understanding of Deming, but two, we haven't necessarily put our brain in the optimum state. And the optimum state isn't just for Deming, it's for anything that you do. The interesting thing, though, is that what Deming allows us to do by practicing the system of profound knowledge, it forces our brain into the learning zone. I'm working with a group um, that does leadership training for NASA, the uh, National Institutes of Health, other than Boeing, other major companies. And we're using the neuroscience to accelerate the way they do it. But they've got another program called the Green Zone. And really, from psychology, what they found in the Green Zone, there's a place that you need to operate in from a psychological standpoint that helps you perform better. And the interesting thing is the neuroscience matches up perfectly with it. So whether you call it the Green Zone or the Learning Zone, um, it's the place that you want to be operating from. When you're in school, when you're in your job, when you're working with your family. Anything you want to optimize in your life. So the interesting thing is, what Deming said is the various segments of the system of profound knowledge proposed cannot be separated. They interact with one another. Now what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> what we ended up doing, <laughs> David and I did one day, I won't make anybody memorize this, but we only drew a few lines. What we found out was every single 
what we, this, this is a map, which you really can't see, but I wanted to give you an idea of the complexity. What we did was we laid out the brain parts, the neurochemical systems, uh, the structures, some of the genes that are activated when you use the theory of uh, the system of profound knowledge. But the key was, and this is what Deming said, every single element interacts with every other single element. So what you do, and what he was encouraging us to do at all times, even though he said you didn't have to be an expert in any one, the key was looking at the whole system by using all four at once. Let me say that again, by using all four at once. And you go, how do you do that? Well, you know what? We do it all the time. Right now, your brain is processing over 100 trillion bits of data right now. You don't have a problem looking at systems. The table that you're sitting at, your parietal lobe is firing like crazy to see who's next to you. Your, your body is trying to figure out, well, my feet are cooler, cooler than my head in a room like this, but I got to keep myself at 98.6. It's already doing that. It's already activating whole bunches of, of, of segments and coordinating them. That's what Deming was asking us to do. Because without that coordination, by totally separating, what we do is we limit neural firing. And limit neural firing, as we'll see here in a second, limits learning. So I've got to figure out how to do this up here. So basically what we found was, was that, um, <clears throat> that when we use the system of profound knowledge, we, we basically fire specific large parts of the brain in diverse areas. So when I'm trying to understand systems and how they re interrelate, I'm firing my prefrontal cortex. When I'm dealing with numbers and the balance and the relationship with numbers, I'm pulling in my cerebellum. When I'm... <clears throat> When I'm trying to attach meaning and emotional significance to the information that, I'm, that I, that I want to apply to a, fish, a system, I'm using my, <clears throat> the limbic system. Now, the limbic system is, if I, oh, I won't make this thing scream at me, but the limbic system is basically built, you guys have heard of this reptilian brain in the bottom there? You've kind of heard of that before. Basically, this guy in the 1970s came up with the triune brain theory that he said that our brain at the very bottom was very much like a reptile, on top of that was a mouse, and on top of that was a human brain. That's a little rough, but it's kind of the, what the, US, I call it the USA Today science tells you it is. It's a little more than that. But, <clears throat> but basically, that's where your emotional charge comes from that information gets tagged with. Oops, I pushed the wrong button. Let me see what I did here. So, um, so that's, the, that's the emotional part. Then this is the, the parietal part of your brain where spatial interactions are put together so you can figure out how things relate spatially and you can make number estimates. The occipital lobe obviously is for vision, but for us most importantly is going to be this temporal lobe which allows us to take detailed piece, the temporal lobe, and really a, a part that's in the inferior front of the, of the prefrontal lobe, the frontal lobes there which helps us look at details and understand the details. Um, and this is basically what our educational system lacks a lot of times. This left part of our brain where finite math and language is represents only 5% of our neural tissue. The key is, if you rep the, the, the way you learn more is to fire more neurons. If I'm only firing 5% of my neural structures, it inhibits my ability to learn. So we've got a whole system that fires only a very small part of your brain, which makes the system itself drive inefficiency within us. So, um, so basically demonstrated long-term commitment to new learning is required. But really, when, when Dr. Deming came up with that statement and understood learning. We have a whole different perspective of what learning is now than what, than what Dr. Deming knew at the time. We've gone farther up the hill. We understand more of what it is. And what is it? Well, learning from a scientific view is a very complex process that in a way is easy to activate. So, Really, back in the 1800s, uh, some scientists discovered, you know, we had neurons in your brain. And the idea was that your neuron, let me grab something here, that a neuron was like a little teacup, and it had little bits of knowledge. So they knew there were 
millions and millions. We now know there's billions, 100 billion of them in your, in your brain. If you add glial cells, it's even more than that. But basically, we've got these 100 billion neurons. And one was for your grandmother's face. Another was for your puppy dog. Another was for your house. OK, so the idea was that all you had to do from John Locke, who was a philosopher from England, was the idea, I don't know if you heard of Table Rosa or Blank Slate is what he came up with in, in, in um, philosophy. But the idea was all you had to do was take one of these neurons and pour a little information in, and learning took place. And basically, that's what our educational system do, is. It's an information delivery system to you. We pour it in. And you take a test, and we think it stays in here. But it doesn't. It does not. It drips right out the bottom. And what does stick often sticks in a way that you can't access it and use it for your own adaption. Learning is all about accelerating your ability to adapt. It's not about passing tests. Passing tests have nothing to do with your ability to adapt. So, <clears throat> so what, hap what we've co come into is we've, we've, we've gone into a world where we think delivering information is causing learning. And at the Institute, the Advanced Learning Institute, we say information does not cause transformation. A lot of times, information just causes confusion. So, so so we've come out of this idea that, so in, in a Canadian um, came up with the idea, the heavy and synaptual learning rule, that there has to be massive firing in your brain before learning can take place. Dramatic massive firing. So what happens is, I'm kind of run through the scientific process pretty quickly, you run into something meaningful, emotional that you care about, or you're afraid of, or, or that makes an impact on you, outside of it, on neurons, you have these branches, these dendrital branches. There's receptor sites. Out of these receptor sites, you see something meaningful, bang. It explodes a, 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 a magnesium molecule is stuck in there, stopping the learning. Something meaningful comes in, it blows that magnesium plug out. Calcium runs into the cell. And a very complex process starts with transcriptions, factors, and everything else that causes genetic expression in the form of neurological growth. You physically change. But no change happens unless there's simultaneous firing in diverse groups of neurons. Not small little groups of neurons, massive groups of neurons. That's why experiential learning is so powerful. That's why the, the, the system of profound learning is so powerful. It forces massive neural firing. You're blowing magnesium plugs out of these are called NMDA receptor sites. And basically, you're transforming the whole inside of that neuron, which in turn transforms you. And as Deming said, as the first step is transforming of the individual. If you want to transform a system, you can't get there with the same knowledge that you built it with. The neural structure that bit, built the system, and it sucks, is going to build it and prove it so it sucks worse. You don't want to be using that. I forget, I was speaking to a, um, a woman last night, and I apologize, I forgot her name. But she said, you know, I'm working in this big corporate organization. It's one of the Fortune 500. And they said, look. Don't bring any more new learning. We don't want to confuse things around here. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to, you know, as Demi said, recycle ignorance. So what we've got is there is no system transformation without biological transformation within you. So and this is the fascinating part, is um, my little laser is so wimpy. Um, so, Basically, what you've got there, those are real neurons, and those are real dendrital branches. All you have to do is learn one thing in those 100 billion neurons. And each neuron can have anywhere from 5,000 or less to 500,000 connections per neuron. What that means is you have more connections per neuron, possible connections per neuron, than there are atoms in the universe. There's a lot going on in your head. But all you have to do is have one receptor site grow. 
Now I'm using, I'm speaking metaphorically if there's any neuroscientists in the audience. But all you have to do is have one simple receptor site go, grow, and it totally transforms you. It has the possibility of totally transforming the way you perceive yourself and the world. So, anybody heard of Edward Lorenz, who came up with the book Chaos back in the late 80s, came up with the Chaos Theory, late 80s or 90s? He's the fellow that said, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Singapore, we could have a hurricane or a tornado in Kansas. So basically the idea is small little changes, small little transformation can cause dramatic transformation. And this can happen in you. And this is what Deming was saying. You don't have to know all the parts of the, the, the system of profound knowledge. You only have to know little bits of it. If you take one little bit and apply it, you can not only totally transform yourself, but you have the possibility of transforming the world. So what I was looking for was a, was a con, the brain processes concepts before details. So what I was trying to do, because this science was a little, I, I was cross-eyed by the time I got through with it. So, but the deal is, what I found was this, a, a, a guy named <clears throat> Daniel Kahneman won, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in 2002. And he, all economists are loving this stuff right now that he wrote. He's mainly a psychologist. He's a statistician, too. Um, but he came up with, in a way, because he came up with ways to look at it through d different analysis, what he came up with was this idea of fast and slow thinking. And what he said was that fast thinking is the kind of thinking that you use when you're running from the bear. And the way I interpret it, slow thinking is the kind of thinking you use when you want to change the world. The problem is, in America, in our modern world, information is doubling every 18 months. We've got all sorts of pressure on us from stockholders and venture. I work with some venture funds that want us to get to profit tomorrow. We don't have time to slow think. We don't think we do. We think we only have time to run from the bear. And the consequences are devastating. Fast thinking is not systems thinking. It's instinctual, it's unconscious, it's automatic, and it makes you react without deep thought. You do it all the time and you don't think about it. It's when you go out in the yard <clears throat> and all of a sudden you go, damn, it's a snake. Well, the truth is it's a hose. That's fast thinking. It keeps you alive. It's really good to have fast thinking in your life. It's kept the evolutionary through our periods for six million years, man alive. But it makes tons of mistakes. It's tremendously inefficient. I'll give you an idea about how inefficient it is and how much we're using it. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House. But we have to pass the bill so you can find out what's in it. And this isn't Democrats or Republicans thinking. They're all thinking like that. We got to go to recess. Let's pass this thing. It's, it, we were talking, um, Judith and Kevin and I were talking the other night about, he was at a, at a meeting, a, a city council meeting, I think, and a group had spent six months doing slow thinking, trying to come up with a way to figure out how to have bikes walk, work on a path. And one of the guys that was on the board said, oh, I got a great idea. Let's just do 180 days for walkers and 180 days for bikers, and we can just, everybody sign this, let's go. So, but when you looked at it from, from deep thinking, it was a ridiculous idea. But nobody was going to take time. I don't know what ended up happening. But the idea is, let's hurry up, get it done, get it off the docket, we'll move to the next thing, without thinking about the ramifications. And this is what's happening to us in health, education, and finance. Why are we in trouble in finance? We've got a whole, all of Wall Street is trapped in fast thinking. I work with them. They are big time trapped. I'm in the health industry, too. And we are real idiots in the health industry. We're killing people left and right. So. The brain structures of fast thinking um, it are the amygdala. This is the part at the very base. You see that little thing that's poking out at the bottom there? Um, it's a little, it's kind of a generalized. So we can call that the amygdala. And basically, um, it's very close to another thing called the hippocampus. But what it does is it tags information. It's like put spice on incoming information. So it tags information with emotional value. 
so that you can pay attention to it. The only way the brain knows to pay attention to anything is if it's got emotional tagging to it. Right now, your brain, as I said, is processing 10 million bits of data. It's paying attention to the stuff that's getting the emotion, most emotional impact, which right now is my voice, unless you got a rock in your shoe. So, so basically, the amygdala tags it with, 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 with emotional energy. There's a little spice to it. The anterior ceniculate, which is on the top up there of, of your limbic system, of your most ancient system, basically what it does is it says, oh, here's some information I better pay attention to quick. It throws it down to the hippocampus, which is a routing arena. It's also part of working memory, but it's a routing arena. And it says, let me match it up with something else. And that's how I ended up thinking my hose with a snake. I saw something wiggly. I got an emotional charge. The anterior ceniculate threw it way back to the hippocampus right away. Oh, it's a snake. Well, it wasn't a snake. But that's what your fast route said. And the fast route works so well because it only uses that little bit of brain. And it's the least evolved part of your brain. Reptiles climbed out of the primordial ooze about 350 million years ago. We got placental bearing mammals about 65 million years ago. Those aren't new structures. So um, let me just get myself here so I can figure out what time it is. So, so basically, it's quick routing information because you're not using a lot of structures. So what does fast thinking cause us to do? What Dr. Deming said is, we just continue to recycle ignorance because you're not able to bring in the new information and match it effectively. So I'm just bringing, I'm just bringing the old crap back out. You see this in corporations all the time. So what is the key to slow thinking? Well, the context that I'm trying to put fast and slow thinking is fast thinking is this lower brain areas and slow thinking are the upper brain areas, many more of them. So basically, the prefrontal lobes are like the executive in charge. It controls everything. It's basically the part that makes us more human. Planning for the future, analyzing multifaceted data, organizing your thought, focusing attention for extended periods, thinking abstractly, basically everything that makes you a human, predicting outcomes, showing mental dexterity, multitasking, focusing attention on your relevant data, working memory, emotional regulation, social interaction. The interesting thing is we're going to see is emotional re regulation is dramatically important into analyzing systems, which you would never think. So cooperation, empathy, weighing consequences, developing strategy, developing dynamic models, schemas, simultaneously considering a lot of actions and making appropriate adaptions. This is the key to unsuccessful attempts. You can't do that using the, using the structures down here. You have to use this. But when you fast think, you can't. Now, how, so basically, the prefrontal areas connect to everything else and are in charge of everything else. What makes you a good football player or a good teacher, a good anything is, is your pre, you allow your prefrontal lobes to operate so that they control everything else effectively. So to break down these areas, I, I kept it to, to, to three <clears> that are the most important. The orbital frontal and the ventral medial, this is where the ancients put the third eye. It's very phenomenal that, you know, 3,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, depending on which ancient religion, they're kind of all focused on that spot, more or less, in one way or another, especially the Eastern religions. So basically what that is, that's your ability to, to deal with emotional regulation, social interaction, and cooperation. Well, the interesting thing, you go, how does that deal with all that other systems and analytical thinking we were just seeing before? Well, what we did was, back in the 90s is when the research first started. They started finding people that had damage in these areas, that had had strokes, uh, trauma hits to the head, uh, they'd had dementia, some other things. And what we found was that these people showed impure judgment, failure to effectively predict outcomes, exhibited incompetence in organizational skills, demonstrated the incapacity to plan for the future, were highly inflexible. They continued to do unsuccessful things over and over again. Their social skills were awfully unacceptable. They made inappropriate decisions. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll were basically a big part of their life. Uh, great discomfort to others, but not themselves. They didn't mind, they didn't mind busting your hump. Didn't bother them at all. Extremely self-centered, <clears throat> and 
a lot of them exhibited almost sociopathic behavior, the inability to connect to your emotions. And here's the fascinating thing. A lot of them had extremely high IQs, but they couldn't do anything with common sense. So for me, this reminds me a lot of bosses I had. And see, what fast thinking does is it drives these people that are stuck in these systems to act like nutcases, to act like brain-damaged people. So if you're in a school system that's using a lot of extrinsic motivators, a lot, or a corporation that's using a lot of extrinsic motivators, and a lot of fast thinking, you're going to have a lot of people that are thinking like brain-damaged people, even if they got high IQs. So our emotions enhance our ability to systems think. How is that? Well, emotions refine our ability to observe. What they do is the only way that your brain can pick out what's important to you and how to apply it is by attacking emotions. Now, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, and it is. Matter of fact, in the 1990s, uh, a guy named Antonio Damasio came up with a book called The Descartes Error that turned the whole neuroscience world on its ear. When I first started doing research into that in the 90s, there was just so much screaming and hollering about this. But he demonstrated conclusively, and he may get a Nobel for this kind of work someday, but what he demonstrated conclusively was that emotion and reason and analytical thinking and statistical thinking all share the same circuits. So therefore, if we're not able to refine our emotions or activate the part of our brain that does refine the emotions, we're not able to make the distinctions in the data that allow us to apply it effectively. And if we're fast thinking, we can't see the distinctions because our emotions aren't being mediated effectively. What those prefrontal areas are doing, what those prefrontal areas are doing up here is they're doing a tremendous job of refining your emotions. So this is why you yell at your spouse when you don't want to or smack your kid or do something that you're, hor you're horrified about or flip somebody the bird while you're driving down the road and you go, that's not me. Well, that's not me because you're fast thinking. So we don't want to use those circuits if we're going to think systematically. But what Deming's theory, what Deming's system did was it forced these prefrontal areas to be activated. So, and the interesting thing is that EQ, emotional quotient, a guy named Daniel Goleman came up with a book called Emotional Intelligence about 12 or 14 years ago. And it, it was another thing that turned everything on its ear, about the same time as Damasio was doing it on neuroscience, Goldman was doing it in psychology, and he found it almost every, uh, probably 99.9% of the cases, the people that were successful in the world were the people that had a high EQ, not a high IQ. So I've got research on valedictorians that will, will, will um, let me make sure I get my time here, that will spin your head does anybody know what percentage of valedictorians go on to do very, not very much of anything? It's about 70%. And even the ones that go on to do stuff, they don't change. The woman who did the study, she had 30,000 30, pages of research on valedictorians. She's from, uh, her name is Arnold. And she did this research in Boston. It was phenomenal. She followed them for years and years and years. She got into where they were in their middle life. And what she found was that her statement was, these are the kind of people that can keep a job, they can be a lawyer, they can be a teacher, but they're not the people that change the world. So what we do is a dramatic disservice to valedictorians. What we do is, they come into the school system with an overabundance, so there's 11 biological intelligences. We've got a, so there's different intelligence to deal with different things. People have heard of Howard Gardner. He did the seven intelligences. Basically, there's been a lot of use of that and, and on and off of probably less effectively than really hasn't worked. But he came up with the idea that we had 
different intelligence. We now know from neuroscience that you have an overabundance of neurons in one part of your brain that nobody else has specifically, but they tend to be generalized in a lot of different areas. We can be social dominant, mathematical dominant, linguistic dominant, <clears throat> these kinds of things. Well, what we, found was, <clears throat> what we found was that the people that were able to put together their, their basically, their dominance in a way that they used emotional intelligence, it blew everybody out of the water with IQ. So what happened to these poor valedictorians was they, they, they activated their brain structures in the left temporal lobe where finite math and language is. So what we were able to do is get very high levels of grades on tests, one, because my brain plan fit the system. So what did everybody do? Everybody kissed their butt all the way through school. And then you drop these poor kids out in the real world. I tell you right now, guys, nobody cares what grade you got in school. I haven't hired one person in my life ever that I ever asked, what grade did you get in school? You know what my question was? Well, this is before I got a little more cosmic than I am now is, are you going to make me money and how? Now I've gotten a little more spiritual, so I don't say it that way. But I say, how are you going to help us change the world? I don't care what your grades are. What I care is what's inside of you. What I care is about your emotional quotient to other people, yourself, and the world. And just to go back, the studies will cool your hair about all the people that have high IQ that haven't gone anywhere. Can you reverse that? Yeah, sure you can. So the gift of, we'll have a few minutes for questions at the end. See, the other thing that these prefrontal areas give you is the gift of empathy and cooperation. It's fascinating. So I'm not guaranteeing this is going to happen when you use um, the system of profound knowledge. But here's what happens. If I activate the prefrontal areas, right, it's like a rising tide floats all ships. So even if you're an emotional klutz, if you've got the blood flow going to this part of your brain, you're much better off. You're going to be much more emotionally competent. So what happens is empathy, cooperation has its roots in empathy. We, we can't be empathetic. We can't be cooperative unless I understand you. You can't manage people. You can't manage systems until you know how other people feel. So the more refined you are about your own processes, the more refined you can be about helping other people. And organizing other people so they can make a difference. I met some of these wonderful people that are, as far as I'm concerned, they're kind of like Sir George fighting the dragon in these educational programs that are really having a dramatic effect. And they've got to have tremendous gifts of empathy. Their, their frontal lobes are really engaged. They've got high levels of empathy, causing great levels of cooperation in environments that are very uncooperative, the school. They're doing a tremendous job because those errors are being activated in them. So what emotion does is, so when I'm using the limbic system and I'm using fast thinking, basically what it's like is going into a dark room and taking a flashlight and trying to squirt it around in there to see what I'm doing. That's why I'm making so many mistakes. When I'm using slow thinking and I'm using emotion and I'm using the prefrontal areas, what I'm doing is I go from sloppy to laser focused. So it's almost like I'm not only putting a laser in the room, I'm putting a spotlight in it to see the system and then I'm using the laser to see the parts of the system. So real quickly, all this stuff gets to get put together that you're that your, orbital, that your orbital frontal and your, and your ventral medial put together and tag, it gets sent to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, is really your brain's workspace. It, 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 it only stays there long enough where you can, it's, when you're working on stuff, it's like a carpenter's bench. So when you, basically what your brain is doing is shifting through these 10 trillion bits of information a second. There's 100 billion bits of information from each eye, 10 million bits a second from your skin, 30 billion bits a second from the ears, you're getting it from your nose, plus you're getting all this subconscious processing. Believe it or not, if I throw out the name, everybody think of your mother. I just fired about another 7 billion neurons, 7 billion connections. So I mean, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. That mother stuff was already being, it's already connected up and in there and, and slowly vibrating anyhow. It's not going away. So there's all this stuff going on. If I remind you of your father or a brother or somebody you knew, that's going on and you know, I can bring it to consciousness, but this working memory area can only hold little bits at one time. 
This is where our telephone numbers, you probably heard this idea, Miller in the 50s came up with our telephone number should only have seven digits because basically that's all a working memory could hold at one time. It's really more than that. But, um, so basically working memory is making order out of this chaotic bombardment of data. That's what working memory is doing. So what it's also this frontal lobe is doing is more effectively matching the new information with the old. So where the limbic system is going, let's run back there and see what it is. Oh, it's a hose, not a snake. What the frontal areas are doing is saying, oh, I, that's really interesting. What I just like today, I got a tremendous distinction from Mike at his conference when he said a goal is different than an aim. The aim is to create learning. The goal is to get good grades. And he, and he said, often they're not connected. And that was a great distinction for me. So I had tremendous, for me, I had new learning come in because I was slow thinking. I wasn't, at that time, I wasn't using my BlackBerry, but uh, <laughs> like I usually do. But, but at that time, I was slow thinking. And what happened was, was I was able to connect something up that I could see the neurochemical importance of what he was talking about and how important it is to make that distinction in corporations, which I had never seen before and I'm going to use a lot. So another thing that Demi did was he said the transformation has to happen from the outside. And what neuroscience does, it gives us a whole new perspective on what he means by from the outside. What, what he means by from the outside is it can mean bringing somebody else in. But what we learn from the field of mindfulness, which is a, it's a kind of an Eastern philosophy, but they, I was just at a conference of neuroscientists, molecular biologists, priests, nuns, and monks. And it was about the neuroscience of, of basically meditation and prayer. It was phenomenal. And what I learned from that was that, that basically there's a part of your brain that gets activated. There's a part of your brain that gets activated when you're mindful. What mindfulness means, it's almost being in a meditative state while you're in action. You detach from your own emotions, you detach from the outcome, and you're just present in the moment. You probably heard the phrase a lot of these motivational or, or speakers say, just live in the moment. Well, that's kind of where that comes from. But what really it allows you to do, it allows you to detach yourself from the system. So really, it, by activating the prefrontal areas, we have the ability for the first time to understand how we can perceive systems from the outside. If we're using slow thinking, we can't. Has everybody seen that thing where the dominoes are lined up and most guys are trapped in the middle of dominoes and all they do is see the domino in front of their face? That's what fast thinking does. You push the domino and you don't know how, how it knocks down all the other ones. But when we detach ourselves, go into a prefrontal state, which mimics this mindfulness state at some level. And I've spoken to people that have been doing Deming's work, and they go, you know, that's the way I feel. I can look at this and be much more detached by using the system of profound knowledge than I was before I was using it. I was trapped in the system. So there's new meaning to that phrase. So here's another piece. And this is important to getting on to what, what Dr. Nemo was talking about of intrinsic motivation. The higher the meaning, the greater the memory. Meaning enhances selection. The brain, there's no such thing as instruction in biology. It's all a selective process. You select in what's meaningful to you. If you're going to remember anything from this talk, you're going to remember what struck you as most meaningful. So. So what I did, the last, the, the, one of the other pieces I did was I said, OK, where does all this math and statistics fit in neurologically? I get the emotion. I was very familiar with all that, quite frankly, what I just talked about. But as I looked into the brain, where, how does the statistical part work? So my idea was, what happened if I unscrewed Dr. Deming's brain, looked at his research, went in there and clomped around a little bit and saw what was happening? So. Basically, genetic variation. I, I said there's these 11 biological dominants that each one of us tends to have a, a predominance in. But they're hooked up differently, which makes each one of us in the world. Basically, there's no two neurons in any two brains in anybody in the world that are hooked up the same way, which means we all perceive the world a little differently through our own lens. 
That's a survival of advantage. But what it does is it makes each one of us a genius. It's something our neighbor isn't. When I first heard this, it blew me away. I ended up going to 7-Eleven. When I read this, really, I, I went, oh my god, we're all geniuses when I looked at it. And I'd go to 7-Elevens and I'd go, well, what do you do, Bob? What do you like to do? He'd go, I like baseball. I'd go, what do you like? And the guy would reel off about 30 batting averages. Or you know, I'd go somewhere at a gas station. I'd talk to somebody and so I'd say, what do you? Man, carburetors. I love carburetors. I do, you know, and they, I mean, they were all, I, I, if you were going to ask the, what the David talks about is wise, if you were going to ask the five questions, I call it, everybody's a genius at something, and you can find it. There is no idiots walking around here. We're all geniuses. The problem is the system doesn't recognize our genius. They think your genius is a valedictorian, which we now know doesn't work, or it's an A, which we know doesn't work. So basically, what these, what these mathematical structures do is they give us mathematical models graphing. We learn a lot of this from a thing called dyscalculia. Believe it or not, as many people have a form of dyscalculia as dyslexia, which is an inability to use numbers as effectively as we'd like. So, and it's really a dyscalculia form of dyslexia, meaning it's, it's the finite use of numbers. It's not the estimation of numbers necessarily, though it, it spreads over. So basically, for the parietal lobe, the big kahuna of a spatial thinking is this parietal lobe. Let me, if you can see it, it's the, it's the yellow up there. So your parietal lobe is where spatial things happen. It's where you put things together. It's really where things get estimated. Right out of the womb, most babies will know if you put them on the floor and you give them something they want to touch, they're going to touch three before they touch two. They recognize more is better. That's what's happening up there. You've got the bilateral posterior parietal system, which is in the back there. And what it does is it allows you to make great estimations in a hurry. What the uh, inner parietal sulcus, sulcus does is allows you, it allows you to see ge geometric shapes, figure out where things are on a number line. What the left anterior gyrus does, it lets you put all that together and figure out how to manipulate them. Uh, probably an easy way to talk about the spatial lobe is it's doing generalizations really effectively. But then what happens when I need to do detail? Or when we need the research is really interesting. When I need to do detail, like what evolution likes to do is it likes to build on what's already there, like the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and what we call right for the moment in generalization, the human brain. It just builds on top of stuff. So what did it do? Well, it took the the area for letters and, and and merged it and made it the same area for, for, for uh, numbers. So basically, math is a language. Some of us are better at it than others. So Broca's area in the, in the, in the 1847 to 1861, these two guys did a lot of research in these language areas with people that were damaged. And Broca found out that, 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 that mathematical production understanding happened in, or not understand, production and analyzing of it and moving around happened in this uh, Broca's area, which is right, ab right above that, the, the point where it's the end of that red thing, right above it in the blue in the frontal area. And Warnicke, which is in the back and the posterior part of your um, temporal lobe, which is, the, which is the orange part, basically what, what Warnicke's did is it lets you communicate those numbers in a way that other people understood them. But the problem is you can't separate those two areas and be effective. Like, I'm a parietal number thinker. I can look at balance sheets and not know what the crap I'm seeing and still figure it all out because I get the generalizations. But I'm not my accountant. So um, you've got to figure out where you are. But the truth is you need both of them to work together. So the problem what we do with mathematics, I've been talking to a bunch of people about multiplication. What we do is Broca's area is the syntax, it's the, it's the letters, it's the ABC on the language side, it's the one, two, three, four. It's also where your multiplication tables are. But you can memorize your multiplication tables that you're blue in the face. You can understand them, but if your parietal lobes aren't engaged, you don't know how to use them. And you really won't remember them as effectively. So we've got to, in the educational system, we have to learn how to teach our multiplication tables by integrating the two, the two parts, the left temporal, the left frontal, and the, the whole parietal areas. So, but that's where, Dr. Deming was doing it. There's also this thing called the little brain, that, that bright thing on the bottom there. It's the cerebellum helps us balance numbers. Um, we called it little brain because back when they first discovered it, they didn't know what the heck it did. It looks like another head stuck in your head, some alien in there. So 
Here's the big part, meaning of psychology, the knowledge of psychology. Without meaning, there's really meaning first. Dr. Demi Turk mainly about intrinsic motivation. He did speak of meaning. But the interesting thing is meaning first, intrinsic motivation second, behavioral transformation third. If you lack any of those, you lack meaning or intrinsic motivation, you lack behavioral transformation. The more we use extrinsic motivators, the less behavioral change you have. Well, people, that's not true. If I tell my kid he's going to get a cookie, and I'm going to give it to him now, if he doesn't do X, Y, and Z, he won't do X, Y, and Z. So it's a really good behavior changer. It's only a good behavior changer in the presence of the reward and punishment. You, re you pull away the reward and punishment, that kid's going to go do what he did before he got the cookie. There's no neurological change through extrinsic motivators. Extrinsic motivators drive the limbic structures. So what, what Dr. Deming is talking about, you have to understand human behavior. The only way to do that is by firing your meaning network and intrinsic motivation, this incredible process where we have magnesium plugs being blown out of NMDA receptor sites. You got calcium running into it. We have this incredible explosion of excitement in your brain where learning takes place. So your brain is a meaning selector. What it wants, when those, when that explosion goes off, you get hits of dopamine and serotonin, norepinephrine, endorphins. You are one happy dude. That's why you like to learn. You don't like to memorize to pass a test. That's not learning. From a biological perspective, the, the, those neurotransmitters are really in us to drive us to, to, to drive those neurotransmitters over and over and over again so we get joy and meaning in our life. So the more knowledge you have in any one area, the more knowledge you can attract. This is why experts, I can pick up any neuroscience book and it just sticks. If I picked up a, a, a knitting book, I couldn't remember a thing. I have huge networks. Dr. Deming had humongous networks for statistical data. And what he was doing, he was learning his whole life. He was, I read some of his stuff three years before he died. He was like a kid wrote it. Now, so what happens is you want to learn a lot. There's some great research on the more you know about it, like they take chess players as one example. I'll look at a chess board, a chess expert will look at a board for five seconds. They'll close it. The, ch the chess expert will remember everything. I'll remember two places. That's because the brain selected in on meaning what was already there. So what you want to do as a manager as a learner, you want to find stuff that's meaningful to you. But more importantly, you want to use your emotional intelligence to open up space in others where they can find out what's meaningful to them. And you as a mentor, not necessarily a leader, as a mentor, can help them enhance their meaning life, meaning in their lives. That's what really managers should be doing. From a biological perspective, leaders are one thing, but mentors are something much more powerful. Think about the people that make a difference in you, in your life. They weren't necessarily general patents. They were people that understood what was meaningful in you and could help guide you. And they helped transform you. So as I was saying, you have the molecules of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. The minute you get into meaning, you change everything. And they want to be repeated over and over again. Basically, what addiction is, it's not a pleasure. There's five different dopamine receptor sites. OK, so it's a very complex process to so kind of simplify it. One of those receptor sites give you pleasure. The other ones make you keep repeating behavior. So you know what happens to drug addicts when they take so much drugs? They burn off the dopamine receptor sites. And when they burn off the dopamine receptor sites, they can't get pleasure. When they, when they, they burn off the ones that give them pleasure, but the ones that make them repeat the behavior are still there. I was in the addiction business. I developed one of the country's only holistic treatment centers. It was accredited by the general hospital population. And what we found was these people would take drugs until they were sick, until their families were gone, until they ruined everything. And they still had no pleasure. They had no pleasure from taking the drug. It was over. But the receptor sites would drive them to keep doing it. Now, that's the negative part. Now, the one, kid, the one reason kids are doing exploratory behavior all the time and having a great time, they have 40% more dopamine receptor sites than 
the guys in this room over 24. So kids at a young age have all these dopamine receptor sites, and they're running around like searching meaning out everywhere and getting joy from it. Then we got this great idea, we're going to lop them in a box, don't let them move, and, and talk to them for 18 years. Let's rip them out. Let's, let's, tur let's turn that spigot down way low. All right. So basically, Houston, we got a problem. And Deming nailed it. Nailed it. He knows no joy in learning. Motivation is a zero deficit mentality. I mean, I'd l I want to get little sound snippets of video from him just with that kind of way to talk, doing it, you know, saying those words, you know, managers, <laughs> monetary reward under such conditions is a way out for managers who do not understand how to manage intrinsic motivation. So basically, we're addicted to extrinsic motivators. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of studies, and I believe a guy named DC at uh, University of Rochester and Amabel, I think she's at Harvard now. I've been reading these studies for over 20 years. And what Daniel Pink says, uh, who wrote a book called Motivation, and what he's really saying is science knows, business continues to do what, what, what science does. Science understands what business shouldn't be doing. Basically, what business is doing is using extrinsic motivators when we know it damages learning. It doesn't only damage learning, it damages focus, attention, exploration, because it's dumbing down your dopamine. The, the more extrinsic motivator, the lower your dopamine, the lower your serotonin. It destroys slow thinking. It makes me think fast. An extrinsic motivator, what do I do to get this goal? Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cram all night. And inhibits the most thing that we need in the world right now is innovators. So if you're in an environment where you're being driven by extrinsic motivators, your ability, your literally physiological, neurological ability to innovate goes down. That's why these entrepreneurial companies, where everybody's around playing pool and their dogs are running all over the place and you know uh, they're having a blast, are so innovative. And where does it start? Where do we learn how to kill people's joy of learning? Right in the educational system. Then what we did is we thought it was such a good idea, we'll start replicating our businesses just to be like the school. We'll make everybody miserable. All right, so what happens when you are trapped in a fast thinking environment for too long? Well, you can fast think and it's just trouble. You're just stupid, right? But if you're trapped in an environment with a bad boss, a bad relationship, you know, a bad anything, what happens is you can end up thinking like a lizard. You start really, it goes even farther down in your brain. And it ain't pretty. It's called a neurological downshift. A guy named Leslie Hart came up with this in the 80s, and I don't know how he came up with it because we didn't have the neuroscience, but he did a tremendous job. What he said was that I believe that the blood flow in the brain is being redirected from the frontal areas to the lower areas when you're under stress for long periods of time. There's been new research since then at Stanford, Harvard, a lot of places. A guy wrote a book called Why, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, a fascinating book. And what they found was that indeed the blood shift flows. The minute I'm under extrinsic motivators, I'm under fear, take the fear out. When I'm under fear, my blood flow shifts down to my reptilian, my less flexible, the areas of part of my brain that can't think. I start yelling at my boss, flipping people the bird, and worse. I, the downshift is happening to those guys, those guys that go postal and walk in offices and shoot people. They can't access the part of the brain that has compassion and empathy. And we've got basically, you know, just at a company I was working with the other day, this wonderful woman went postal to her boss. She's the greatest person I'd ever met, the most kind. This guy created an environment. She turned her into postal. So basically, the downshift for too long, it's not just being stupid anymore. We are literally damaging our brain. This guy who did the, did the book at Stanford, uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, what he found was that basically there is dramatic neurological and physiological damage. We believe that right now a guy named Benson, who did the relaxation response, a book back, I think, in the early 80s, and the research is, is confirming it, he estimated that almost 80% of hospital visits were driven by what we call a downshift now, people that are downshifted. Here's what happens in the brain. 
It kills neurons. It's like pouring acid. It's like cutting a hole in your head and pouring acid. After only 20 minutes, it kills neurons. It withers neural connections. It inhibits the creation of new brain cells. It affects specialized glial cells, which basically make myelin, the insulation that goes around the, the dendrital branches. It promotes the negative expressions of there's a thing called the CFOS gene. If it's expressed too long under extrinsic motivator and stress, it can create neurological tangles. So you can't think your way out of a problem. And it causes never neural reactions. Have you ever seen those things on the Discovery Channel? I couldn't find a good slide. Um, but where they're swimming up, the trout are swimming upstream, salmon are swimming upstream, and then they get to the top of the top of the thing and they give their eggs and then it's all over and then they flop around and you know basically. Basically, what's happening to them is it's a death by cortisol. It's a death by stress hormone. So what happens is the same hormone that comes out of you when you're under stress cortisol is released into the body at high, high levels from the adrenal glands. They get peptic, peptic ulcers, kidney liaisons, their skin, pe skin peels off, their immune system collapses, they're teeming with parasites and infections. It's just, this is nasty. And that's what happens. That's why you feel so sick a lot of times after, t after studying for tests. Or when you're in an environment that where the boss is a dork. And so this, cort this cortisol stress response thing, it comes from these, right above on top of your kidneys, the adrenal gland, the cortisol is coming from the top, um, the cortex of the adrenal gland. I mean, from the uh, yeah, cortex of the adrenal gland. So bad bosses, bad relationships stick you there. So the difference between a downshift and fast thinking, you can fast think and not fry your brain cells. You can fry because you can jump back from a from a from a, a snake or run from the bear and you won't fry your brain cells. But if you're under that for too long and you're in a downshift, you can kill yourself. So you've got a choice as a leader. What kind of environments do I create inside myself and in others? Am I gonna be create Neanderthals? In my organization, am I going to create systems that allow me to have ne people act as Neanderthals? Or am I going to use the system of profound knowledge and recognize that everybody in my organization is a genius at something that somebody else in the organization isn't? And how do I create, how do I create systems? And how do I use the system of profound knowledge where everybody is intrinsically motivated, workers, students, leaders, management, so we can transform the world. There you go. So thank you.